good Monday to all of you NFL fans, wherever you are. This is Doug Farrar, NFL editor for USA Today and the USA Today Sports Media Group. And the guy over there in the uh, NFL Film offices in Mar- Mount Laurel, New Jersey, is Greg Cosell, senior producer for NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. And Greg, my gosh, training camps. Rookies are reporting next week. Pretty soon we'll be getting up at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning to watch NFL Matchup, which is kind of cool. And, uh, <laughs> there are DVRs for such things. Yes. Uh, uh, two two modest suggestions. Make it an hour and put it on later in the morning. That's just me. Now, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Farrar, I don't control that. I just show up. That's, you know, you're the talent. You just show up and do your thing and go home. Yes. Yeah, you don't put any back work into it. It's not like 80 hour weeks or anything. No, I'm, the, I'm the prima donna talent, so I just show up. Yeah, that's what we know about you. Well, uh, yeah. we're, we're here. We brought your prima donna self on uh, in this week's <laughs> X's and O's podcast slash video slash series of articles. Uh, we've been talking about different position groups, like building the ideal secondary, ideal defensive line, ideal offensive line. And as we sort of tumble into the uh, training camp era and we get you know a little more focused we'll talk about quarterbacks very soon but i wanted to extend this idea of position groups with building the ideal receiver core and that jordan rodriguez of the athletic has a really great new podcast called the play callers and she talked to like kyle shanahan and sean McVay, like everyone in the McVay slash shanahan sort of offensive tree And she brought up a point that you and I have discussed before, but I hadn't really heard it encapsulated like this. She made the point in the podcast that defenses used to be about this or that, and now it's about this and that. And what she meant by that was something that, again, you and I have discussed a lot, which is, you know, overload fronts and shifting fronts and this and that. And, you know, all of a sudden it's not cover three, it's cover three that switches to cover two or quarters or whatever. And we've talked about these sort of shifting sands in the hourglass, like days of our lives, how that affects quarterbacks. As we get into building an ideal receiver core, how have these sort of paradigm shifts in defensive philosophy, how do they affect receivers in general? How have you seen that change for receivers? Well, I mean, a a very simple starting point is that receivers have to read coverage the same way that quarterbacks have to read coverage. Right. Because you can draw up routes and everything is drawn up as a structural ideal. So in other words, if you have a route concept uh, for the sake of discussion, let's just call we'll deal with, let's say, a three level stretch, a flood Mm -hmm. concept where there's three routes to one side of the field, a short route, an intermediate route and a vertical route. Now, a vertical route is a vertical route. It could be a straight go route or it could be a deep post. Um, An intermediate route, that route then functions to some degree based on coverage. Um, Now, in an ideal world, you run it at a certain depth. But if the coverage does not allow you to run it at a certain depth, you must make an adjustment because the quarterback will see that, hey, the way we practice it potentially all week long he, the receiver may not be able to make his break exactly in that spot because, hey, maybe the underneath defender has gotten more depth. He sunk a little further, so he's taken away exactly where my intermediate route's going to go. Um, you know, things like that. You know, that's just one example. There's many, obviously. But the point is, is that receiver... And that's, by the way, where your option routes come in, and we're going to discuss that right. more specifically later. But by the way, the, the, the overriding point is that receivers... A must be able to read coverage the same way that a quarterback does. I remember years ago having this conversation with Sterling Sharp. He used to be in our building here at NFL Films all the time. Yep. And Sterling Sharp was a great, great receiver who, unfortunately, his career was cut short by a neck injury and he could no longer play. But believe it or not, I remember having a conversation with a coach who once told me that he thought Sterling Sharp was a better receiver than Jerry Rice and that if he had been able to play a full career that we would have seen that. Now, obviously, pure, just, uh, pure tools, that isn't as uh, out, like outlandish as people might think. Right. So, uh, But the point is, I remember him telling me that he had to learn, you know, he and Brett Favre, and he, he was with Brett Favre in Green Bay, obviously, and Mike Holmgren was there at the time, that he had to learn, along with Brett, how to read coverage. So let's say he was running a route that was supposed to break at at 14 yards. Mm -hmm. Well, if the coverage dictated, he would break that off at 12 yards. Okay. And that might not seem like a lot when we're just talking now, but it is a lot. 
because it changes the timing of the route and of the throw. And the so quarterback, the quarterback and receiver have to be on the same page as to exactly what that, you know, if it's right. an in-cut and you run an out and there goes the ball and, oh, the quarterback stinks, no, the receiver ran the wrong route. Right, because there's many, many times when I'm watching tape, and I'm sure you see the same thing, where you see a quarterback throw a ball, and it looks like, oh, man, that's that's not a precise ball placement throw. He just made right. a bad throw. But that's not always the case, because it might be where the receiver broke his route off at a certain point because he read the coverage a specific way, and the quarterback didn't read it exactly the same way. Yep. Um, so the overriding point is that, with the changing nature of defenses, which is what your starting point was, yes. and particularly now with a lot more disguise and late movement with defenses, receivers, and this is one of the major adjustments college receivers make getting to the NFL, is they have to be able to read coverage on the move, mm -hmm. just like quarterbacks have to be able to read coverages as they drop. Receivers have to read coverage on the move. There's some high, high level talented receivers who never quite grasp that. Yep. Um, there's many less talented receivers who are masters of that. And therefore, they can play in the league for a long time because at the end of the day, they find openings in coverage, particularly zones. Yep. Man is obviously a little different. But the other thing that we're seeing a lot more of, too, is you're seeing a lot more of mixed coverage concepts where there's sort of man on one side, zone on another. There's coverage like quarters, which is ah, quarters. And we've discussed a lot about quarters because of yeah. the Vic Fangio factor, but quarters is basically man with rules. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's, it, that gets coached differently by different coaches as to how those rules get applied, but it's man with rules. Yeah. I remember the first, and, and this happens to every quarterback, the greatest quarterback of all time. It happened to you. You remember the first half of the first season that Tom Brady was in Tampa Bay and he was overthrowing Scotty Miller by 30 yards. Yeah. I'm near Miller. They were just seeing it differently because they hadn't, you know, right. <laughs> the mind meld had not happened yet. And then they had that buy and they switched a few things and then bang, you know, they, and they went off. And did which raises did. another point. And again, you know, we could talk about this for three days, right. but receivers have to be able to give quarterbacks indicators as well as to when they're going to yes. make their breaks, yes. you know, because that's how anticipation and timing happen in the NFL, you know, um, and Kurt Warner is a master of talking about this because Kurt yes. Warner, I mean, he'll joke forever that he was able to build houses based on his ability to make those anticipation dig route throws to Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt. But that doesn't just come, you know, you no. got to practice that over and over and over again because you're throwing the ball before the receiver makes his break. There has to be some indicator somewhere along the line. You're not just not throwing the ball randomly. Although a lot of throws – and now there's even more to this. A lot of throws are what we call spot throws. Yes. You're throwing it to a spot and, and it looks like, wow, unbelievable timing and anticipation, but that's all practiced. I remember Ron Jaworski, who's a good friend and I worked with for years and years and years. He told me that he could wrote put a little book with him too, as I remember. What's that? Wrote a little book with him too, as I remember. Yeah, I did. I did that. Yes. The games that changed the game. Um, but I remember him telling me that he could put on a blindfold and make certain throws because they're spot throws. You know, based on the drop, you know, five step, seven step, and then just turn it loose with timing. You know, he could he could make those throws blindfolded. Yep. And it, I, I've told this Holmgren story before when he was Bill Walsh's offensive coordinator. And, and uh, I don't remember the quarter. It was Montana or Young threw a ball and it was to one of the eights on the receiver. No, 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 no. You need to hit it here. This isn't good enough. It has to be here. I mean, four inches makes a difference. Um, when we get into the ideal receiver core, I want to start with tight ends. And the thing you said about sitting in zones resonates here because Travis Kelsey, who, I mean, I, we can talk about bests and lists and whatever. Um, when I look at Kelsey, uh, he, to me, is the ultimate zone killer because he has such a nuanced and practiced understanding of on, not only where zones break and where their breaking points are, but how then to alter his routes and sit in them. So we're talking Kelsey, Mark Andrews, George Kittle, whoever. Um, what are the sort of, I mean, again, we have to put it in a funnel because we could talk about this, as you said, for three days. But in the modern NFL, where the tight end position has changed to a greater, lesser degree, or say less 10 or 20 years, um, what are the absolute requirements for that position in the context of an entire receiver group? Ugh. We're not talking about blocking here. That's a whole different right, thing. Right, right, right. We'll take well, that off the table. 
again, you know, that that's a very broad based question because not every tight end is Travis Kelsey and right. not every tight end has the same kind of traits. Um, in an ideal world, what you would like to have with your tight end is the ability to be a three level dimension. In other words, have vertical ability, be a seam stretcher. You'd love to have that ability because that expands your pass game and makes defenses have to defend more because then there's more offensive weapons that can be vertical dimensions and that causes more problems for the defense so that's what you'd like to have in an ideal world but if i could just respond to something you said about travis kelsey i think that one of the things that maybe isn't talked about very much and and i remember mike march talking about this to me when i was very fortunate to be invited by coach march to the rams training camp years ago when he was um uh, the head coach, and he basically told me, hey, you're here for three, four days, you're a coach, do whatever you want, uh, you know, and, and it was one of the most unbelievable experiences of my life. Yeah, that's um, fun, jeez. So, but I remember, you know, the whole idea that, you know, there's gray areas in zone coverage, okay? Yeah. Otherwise, everybody would play the same zone. It, zones don't take away everything, you know, um, uh, and of course, defensive coaches are trying to do more with zones now to account for the fact that, hey, there are gray areas, but tight ends and wide receivers too, and, and even and play callers, they have to understand where the gray areas are, and they call route concepts and combinations accordingly to put whether it's underneath defenders, whether it's corners, whether it's safeties, try to create conflict for them because they have more than one area or they have a wide area to to cover. You know, a, a certain amount of yardage in which their zone tells them to, to, to cover. That's their area. So you try to create route concepts that kind of put them, oh, well, I see a receiver coming kind of in my short area. Oh, but then there's a receiver who might be in my, you know, deeper area. What do I do? How do I, you know, do I drop deep that I'm giving up that? Do I stay short because I think I have a guy who's going to be able to handle the guy behind me? Um, so there's gray areas, there's open voids. And yep. You know, you mentioned Kelsey. He's a master at that. But the point is, is receivers have to understand that. And different coaches, defensive coaches, coach zones a little bit differently. And that's what film study is leading up to a specific opponent. Hey, if this team plays cover three, how do their flat defenders play? Do they sink 15 yards? Do they sink 12 yards? How do their hook to curl defenders play? Do they drop deep or do they tend to drop shorter? You know, you have to understand all these things about his own coverage so that when you're putting together your pass game game plan, you can attack it. And then your, your receivers um, have to understand that as well. So they know how they can work to find those voids. I want to go to outside receivers and we think about the X ISO and the alpha dog, and <clears throat> we, we might assume that there are more throws to outside receivers than anywhere else. Um, these numbers per sports info solutions from last year uh, outside receivers got 31% of all targets slot receivers got 48%. And that's a lot of three by one that's inside and outside slot. Yeah. But when we talk about outside receivers and we've talked so much about quarters coverage in the last three or four weeks, three or four episodes as kind of the new thing that's really expanded. So I went back and looked from last season at the most prolific receivers, not like, anyone but just wide receivers or slot receivers against quarters and the names up top justin jefferson cd lamb dk metcalf tyree kill are the ones you'd expect so let, let's start there but then you go to like then it's tyler lockett and it's hayden hurst and it's you know it's like the second guys also. Well, let me ask you this do you by chance and i don't have this number in front of me um do you by chance know what the percentage in the league was of three by one sets versus two by two sets? Uh, I don't, but uh, I will I'll look that up. I'm just curious because it, 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 that those are two different things, as you know. So let's let's. Yeah, talk I actually about have that in my notes to talk to you about three by one and two by two sets because what I was thinking of, and we can get to this now, like the old Peyton Manning three by one thing when he was with the Colts, where it was. Wayne and Harrison and Dallas Clark, and it was the same damn formation every time. Right. And you knew it was coming, well, and you couldn't stop it. That doesn't the reason exist. I mention that and why it's so critical is when you're in a th – let's deal with three-by-one sets. Yeah. And again, I don't have a percentage right in front of me, but three-by-one sets are very, very prevalent in the league. Yes. As you know. I mean, I, like I said, I don't have a specific percentage, 
but it's 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 going to be a meaningful one. Huh. Um, so when you have a three by one set, you have three receivers to one side of the formation, almost always to the wide side of the field. Mm -hmm. You have a single receiver. We call him the X to the short side of the field. He's to the boundary side. Hence, we call him the boundary X. Now, think of it this way. The three receivers to one side, that's where your combination routes come from because there's three receivers working to one side. So they're often <laughs> running routes that work in tandem with one another in terms of depth, okay? Because obviously you and, – and floor balance. I mean, that sounds like a basketball term, but anytime you're playing in somewhat confined space, and even though football doesn't seem like confined space because when you're watching on TV, it's not like watching a hockey game or an NBA basketball game. You know, it doesn't seem as confined. It still is a confined space sport. There's only a certain amount of space, okay? So you have to design route concepts and combinations – that create space. You don't want your receivers, you know, to be two yards from one another when they get to the top of their route stems. Okay. Right. So that's where you get your combination routes with the three, three receivers, the boundary X receiver more often than not is running an individual isolation type route. Now, once in a while, he'll be in combination with a back who's offset to that side. If a team runs empty, yes, there might be a combination route to, the, to that two-receiver side. But more often than not, that boundary X is running an individual isolation route. So that receiver, that boundary X, has to be able to win one-on-one. -on -one. That is an absolute prerequisite for a boundary X receiver. Now, you can win multiple ways, Doug, as you know. You right. can win because you, you separate phenomenally well at the top of your route stem. You can win because you're big and physical and basically can win with competitiveness and physicality, and that provides enough space for a quarterback to get you the ball. You can win because you're phenomenal making, making contested catches. You, know, you can win multiple ways, but the point is you're running a lot of individual isolation routes in which you have to win against a corner one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean there's never winning one-on-one -on -one with, with trip to the three-receiver side. Of course there is. But the point is, it's just different. You know, you can run combination routes with three receivers. You can't run combination routes with one receiver. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jamar Chase is probably the best uh, boundary X guy. Even he can't, like, split in two, at least. I mean, you mentioned, you know... You mentioned Justin Jefferson. You mentioned Metcalf. You mentioned C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb is a fascinating player because he's obviously a very good receiver, but he's not a boundary X. C.D. Right. Lamb is actually a Z or a slot. He's a movement receiver. See, right. the boundary X is on the line of scrimmage. He can't go in motion. So what happens to the three receiver side, you have to get a receiver who's off the ball, okay? And C.D. Lamb is phenomenal at that. He is a movement motion receiver who works best to the multi-receiver side of the formation. He's, he's phenomenal at that. Very often, receivers who you want to get free access off the ball because maybe they're not great against press coverage because, as I said, the boundary X is on the ball, so he can be pressed. So that's another attribute that a boundary X has to have. He has to be able to defeat press without disrupting his route. Um, receivers, you want to get free access off the ball. They're not boundary X receivers. They're receivers you want off the ball to the three receiver side because you can put them in motion. They can be off the ball in terms of their alignment and they have more space with which to begin their route. And therefore press coverage is nowhere near the factor it is for the single receiver, the boundary X who's on the ball. Yeah, as you said, the ability to play man coverage as a cornerback is a must. So obviously, you have to you have to be able to defeat it. Well, and then we'll get into the the inside and outside slot guys, the Z's and you know the slots and, and that whole thing and tight ends, you know, yeah, out into the slot, which also happens more. Right. And here comes my favorite Greg Cosell phrase, which is receiver distribution location. Which gets a to my next guys, point. I see this especially against uh, too high. A lot of times that three by one becomes a two by two because you're motioning to the two by two pre-snap. Right. I see more of that now too. So you're sort of changing the picture for the defense. I assume based on what you see as the quarterback or you know, you're audibling. All right, let's motion over here because no, we want a two by two because they're doing this. So and, and we, you might start to see more two by two 
yeah. in response to quarters, because yes. as I said, quarters becomes man with the rules. That's what it mm -hmm. essentially is. So if you have two by two, and let's say by chance your two inside receivers in the two by two set, the two slots mm -hmm. are wide receivers. Okay, so now your safeties in quarters have to cover those guys. And and again, now you get into those rules. At what point, if an inside receiver, if the inside receivers in a two by two set, the two slots, if they run vertically off mm -hmm. the ball, okay, yep. at what point do the safeties match up man to man? Because they've got to match up at some point man to man. Uh, so, you know, I, I had a conversation years ago with Steve Wilkes, and um, who's now the DC for the 49ers, uh, yep. replacing D'Amico Ryans. And, you know, different coaches have different beliefs as to does he match up at eight yards? Does he match up at 10 yards? Does he match up at 12 yards? Again, you know that from film study and you know that from coaches. Because in this league, coaches coach against coaches. They know what other coaches do just right. because they've been doing it for years. You know, that's one of the early things I learned when I really got into film study is that coaches coach against coaches because yeah. they know what they do. Um, so, you know, two by two could become more in play simply because of the increase in quarters coverage, because now you want to ask safeties to really have to match up to wide receivers. And, and it sort of flips to the three by one as well. One of the things we've seen in three by one is we've seen, uh, and Andy Reid started doing this a number of years ago, but we see it across the board now is a lot of teams will put speed at the inside slot yeah. to trip. I know exactly what you're going to talk about. It'd be most indefensible formation in the NFL when Tyree. And, Kill you know, he did that with Tyree kill back yeah. years ago. Yeah. And before teams got a real sense of how to deal with that, particularly when you're playing cover three. Okay. In cover three, it was there. It was a real problem because very often what would happen is your underneath defenders would have to run with three vertical. Okay. And that's a problem. Because underneath defenders are often linebackers, and I can still see in my mind Tyree Kill running those deep over routes uh, because the safety had to cheat a bit to the other two receivers on the yep. trip side. Yep. And, you know, uh, linebacker types are not going to run with the Tyree Kills. Of them. And when the safety I moves over, that leaves Kelsey, who's the boundary Y, I guess we'd call him, wide open to run the post while, Kel or while Hill's running you over and you're just done. Go home. Yeah, I mean, so number three to trips, teams now, you know, uh, this gets also into why it is the importance of having a tight end who can be your boundary X, the single receiver, becomes so important because then you have three wide receivers to the trip side, okay? And if you have a tight end like a Kelsey, like a Darren Waller, um, I'm missing some guys, obviously. Mark but, Andrews, George yeah, Kittle. Like yeah, that. you know, the, the tight ends who can run a little bit, okay? Yeah. That that base, you know, if they're the boundary X, you know, if they run vertical enough, that means the corner over them has to stay with them, can't come off them, okay? So Dalton now, Kincaid, who went to the Bills in the first round, who's kind he's, of a he's that kind of I receiver. Can't wait to see him in that offense, that kind right. of guy. So now your 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 inside trips receiver, if he runs a deep over, the corner to the single side, he's he's occupied by the boundary X, and the the single deep safety, if it's cover three. He's kind of cheating a little bit to the other two receivers to trips. So you get the inside slot to trips running a deep over against an underneath defender who's got to carry him. And that's why teams put speed at number three to trips. I mean, even for people who follow college football, a few years ago when Alabama won the national championship and beat Ohio State, they might remember that Devonta Smith caught a touchdown on this exact concept where he ran a deep over against, I believe, Borland, who was a linebacker for Ohio State. Yes. Oh, God, poor Chris Borland. Yeah, and, and – wasn't his and, fault. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't the line, you know, the linebacker tried to do his job, but he – you know, that's just a, an athletic mismatch. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, one more thing about that, the whole motion from three by one to two by two. If you if you take that three by one, let's say Jamar Chase is your boundary X, you move Tyler Boyd over there, and they're not running verts, they're crossing. Right. And now what do you do? That whole right. thing. So let, let's let's take There's that. so many. I mean, we could talk about that. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We I can mean, continue this next week, you know, if you yeah. like, because there's so right. much more with receivers and concepts. And, and you mentioned Jordan Rodriguez. I'm sure they get into that a ton and what she do. does, you know, she's, un, you know, she's a star. She yep, does she an is. unbelievable job with what she does. Um, but, you know, there's so much more to all this and, and, you know, this is the chess match in football now. I mean, this is what it's, what it is. I mean, 
especially since you're going to see a lot more of disguise and late movement and changing coverages and mixed coverages and trap coverages. And, you know, again, it's all comes from film study and how you want to try to take care of certain things. But, you know, this is this is what the game is. Just to, to wrap up here with the slot receiver, whether you're inside or out, moving or not, and I, I kind of think of Cooper Cup as the ideal guy right now. Um, but you can go back to Wes Welker and whoever. I mean, option routes are a thing. Two-way goes are a thing. If you're a slot receiver in today's NFL and you want to be that you know marquee guy, and slot receivers can be marquee guys right now, what do you need to do? Hmm. Well, there's different kinds of slots, but obviously yeah. – um, you know, one of the things you see a lot with slot receivers is the ability to to transition and change direction. Uh, you know that for again, there's different kinds. So I don't want people to think, well, every slot receiver has to do oh, that no. or else, you know. Right. But I mean, you see the Tyler Boyds of the world. He's a good example. You know, the ability to run pivot routes, whip routes, yep. routes, you know, change, those are change of direction routes. Those become really, really critical. And then if you get, as you mentioned, when we started this, you talk about a quarterback placing the ball exactly where it needs to be if it's placed properly. And of course, Joe Burrow can do that. Um then you get that's where the run after catch comes from. Run after catch comes 99% of the time from the quarterback, not from the receiver. Right. Yep. Yep. All good stuff, Greg. Yeah, we could. This is one of those where <laughs> yeah, we can, hey, we can I open the box. I love, talk, I love talking again. about this. We can do yeah. this again, you know, for the next two weeks if you want. Yeah. So that's uh, that's another part of the ongoing chess match of the NFL and uh, in, and college football. So that's uh, that's the encapsulated version of our ideal receiver core on the X's and O's with Greg and Doug, and uh, we'll be talking more X's and O's next week. Thanks a lot, Greg. Thanks, Doug.